Welcome to a Celtic State of Mind, I'm Paul John Dykes and today I'm joined by Jim Orr. Jim, welcome to a Celtic State of Mind once again. Thanks for asking me Paul. It's an absolute pleasure. We hope to bring you our listeners daily content, be that video or podcast content on a daily basis. And Jim, you've been on the podcast on two previous occasions and today I'd like to talk to you about some different aspects of your Celtic support in life. First of all, I'm aware that you visited Cathkin Park recently the former home of Third Lanark and the now home of the Jimmy Johnston Academy and Charitable Trust. Tell me your thoughts of this historical football stadium. I think obviously Third Lanark played here up to 1967 or so and then it fell into a bit of disrepair and I actually went to the school across the road. And uh, my earliest memories of Cathkin Park is where people came to fight. Basically, at, at my school, if everyone wanted to have a square go, half the school would appear here at four o'clock and watch two guys uh, batter lumps out of each other. Uh, the school I played for sometimes played in Caskin Park, but then it fell into disrepair. It's a bit of a mess for quite a number of years. And then Jim and the guys in the Jimmy Johnson Academy have turned up and completely transformed the place. It's a bit of a shrine to the wee man, and if you get a chance, you should come down and see it, because uh, there's, there's, there's lots to see. There's lots to see, and it sparks a lot of good memories, Jim. What were your memories of the one and only Jimmy Johnson? I think what's interesting down here, there's a, there's a kind of wall with a number of letters on it that come in from people all over the world. So obviously uh, it wasn't just football supporters that remember Jimmy Johnson or people from Scotland. There's uh, letters from pop stars and politicians all over the place. And I think things how, things were very different back in the 60s. You didn't get a chance to see much football out with your own team. So you only knew maybe a kind of handful of players in the world, your kind of Pellies and your, and your Eusebios and stuff like that. And people knew Jimmy Johnson and... And he wouldn't have known Jimmy Johnson unless he was special. So he was part of a kind of a handful of elite players. I think it's people get excited about your own players, but when people from other countries get excited about your own players, then you know he's something special. And you had the great pleasure of actually meeting Jimmy Johnson. I remember you talking about that in one of our previous podcasts. What were the circumstances of your meeting with Jinky? Aye, well, I was involved with a campaign called Save Your Celts in the, in the early 90s uh, when. Uh, the old board were, were going nowhere in particular and uh, the fans were a bit fed up with them. So a few guys got together and thought maybe we should try and do something, whatever something was. And we got together with the fanzine guys. And part of that was having a think about how could we maybe get some ex-players involved. And then one day I saw on the back page of Jimmy Johnson talking about how Terry Cassidy would, would completely kill off Celtic. And I thought maybe we should contact Jimmy Johnson. Maybe if you get Jimmy Johnson to front this up, people might maybe pay more attention. So... Uh, it was the Sun, it was the paper involved, so I thought I'd phone up the journalist concerned and ask, will he give me Jimmy Johnson's phone number, thinking there'd be no chance of that happening. And the guy said, no bother, there you go. And then the bizarre thing was, he's in the phone book, so I could have just picked up the phone and phoned him. And I got his, uh, his number from this, this journalist, and I uh, phoned him up in the afternoon, spoke to his son, I gave my name, and then the next day was a Saturday, Saturday morning, so the phone goes at half nine, I answered the phone, kind of half tired, and this other guy at the end says, this is Jimmy Johnson, and you're thinking, ah, he beats it. And it's Jimmy Johnson, it's bizarre. So I, I explained the situation, what we're trying to do, and he's happy to get together. So he asked me, does a, did, I know he's, did I know he's local boozer? No, I don't know he's local boozer, but someplace in Nuddingston. So we arranged to meet on a Tuesday night, and uh, so there's four other guys on the committee and save ourselves. I said, tell them. And usually they leave everything to me. But, oh no, we need to come with this. This will be great. Go to this. So I end up driving another three guys along. And the main guy, Willie Wilson, who you've had on your mm-hmm. podcast before, he, he, he couldn't make it. So I'm taking another three guys. And you're meeting Jimmy Johnson. It's quite surreal. And he can't move without people offering to buy him drinks. It's just incredible. You know, it's just like, he's like, he's like Jesus. You know, stuff. You know, people just every two minutes, hey, you will be man, sort of thing. So we explained what we're trying to do, et cetera, et cetera. But it kind of descended into... I kind of asking lots of questions of Jimmy, who's your favourite player and who's this, who's that sort of thing. And then we ended up up the road, so I offered to take him home. So I'm, I'm, Jimmy Johnson in the passenger seat and dropping Jimmy Johnson off. Quite, quite surreal, surreal. So nothing came of it after that. But uh, so that was our kind of big night, guys in the committee who met Jimmy Johnson. Big thing. So we night out with Jimmy Johnson. Aye. I'd be interested to hear if Jinky makes it into your greatest 11. What is your all time Celtic 11, Jim? Well, I'm 60, so we'll, we'll call it the last 60 years. Is that what you would tend to That's do? That's fair enough, yeah. Right. So I think in any kind of all-time great 11, you can start with the Lisbon lines and then see who you drop, basically. And I think there was maybe maybe three tiers of that. Your level one, level two, level three guys. Level one, as I said, Jimmy Johnson and Tommy Gamble, basically. At that time, who were the who were guys who would make an all-time world 11? 
the two of them, I think. It's all about opinions, end of the day. Who's your level two? And I thought, maybe Bobby Murdoch, maybe Bertie or Bobby Lennox. That's my, that's my, that, that tier. And then the rest of the guys are kind of level three. No disrespect, just in terms of how you're structuring the team. So, so Jinky and Tommy Game were straight in the team. And then you start to go through the team to figure out who gets what position. Goalkeeper, hard to see past Big Forster. I think because of the size of the guy, because of his presence, he saved so many penalties, he's worth so many points. And I think the other thing is you get as you get a bit older and you look back in football in the old days, it's maybe not as good as you thought it was. Because I remember watching the, the infamous four each game mm-hmm. at Ibrox. They were showing the highlights. There was a Celtic T V was on for a wee while during the nineties. It was a kind of sky Celtic kind of stuff. I remember the, the advert, Bart Simpson. Aye, aye. So so they had this thing on and they were showing highlights of the four each game. And my oldest son at the time's about, I don't know, about 10, 12. And I said, come here, see this, this is, this is outstanding, this is brilliant. And there was about 20 minutes of highlights. And after it finished, he said, that was rubbish. He said, look how slow they are and look how the ponderous they are. And they're all chasing the ball. And, and looking at it through his eyes, he thought, maybe. So I think as the years go by, maybe you've got that rose-tinted spectacles. And if you compare maybe a Ronnie Simpson with Foster, you know, Foster's a giant, you know, compared to some Simpson's a great goalkeeper and all that, but... Foster's a giant. Foster's in goals. Right back, Danny McGrain, don't have to think about that. Gamble's left back. So who do you put in the two centre centre back positions? So is it is this guys who've been good for Celtic or just guys who are who are good who played for Celtic? What's your criteria? I would say they're Celtic performances. Right. So you don't want Van Dyke in there? Well, I I probably would have Van Dyke based on his performances at Celtic. Even though at the time the opposition maybe weren't too too clever. They weren't great. You're right, they weren't great. But I think I remember watching him, Jim, and just thinking he was a he was a level above, absolutely, just about everybody around about. Him. Absolutely, but uh, I'm trying to think back to the games in Europe. Maybe you, maybe your memory's better than me, but I, that was he, he outstanding was, in Europe? Did he excel in Europe? I don't you know? think he was outstanding. And in actual fact, I remember us sending off against oh, aye, Inter Milan. No, no, you know, right. uh, which probably well, I'm saying it cost us the a bit time. naive. It was it a bit was. daft at the time. So, so if I'm not allowed Van Dyke, are you, are you knocking him back. You can have Van Dyke. I'd, I'd certainly have him in my. Right, team. I'm having Van Dyke then. He's in. Like he's in. I think another one is one of your favourites, George Conley. I think I'd have him in. Uh, I think what might have been, but even at the time he was there, he'd shown enough. Two footed, can head the ball, can organise, and, and that maybe two three year period when when he played sweeper. You're thinking that's him for the next ten years. Mm-hmm. Obviously things didn't work out that way. So so we'll go with Van Dyke Conley. That's that's the centre back. South watering. Partnership. Aye, so midfield, so so it would be going four three three or what we're doing here. Disney matter. You're the boss. I'm the boss. I can do what I want. Paul McStay has to be there. Got everything. That's easy. One of one of my favourites at the time, who should have been Celtic manager, I suppose, after Big Billy's second spell was Aitken. Big Big Roy had a team. Uh, I think you need somebody with a bit of drive in your team, a leader on your team. So I'm going to go for Roy Aitken. If we go four three three, and another player in there, Nakamura. Maybe in terms of skill, Nakamura. Three up front, Johnson's in there because he's a level one player. Dalglish the and Larson, that's your, that's your next two, I suppose. It kind of picks itself. It's like an unbalanced team now, I'm kind of thinking about it. So can you have Nakamura and Johnson in the same team? I think they managed them. They're two kind of luxury players. That's the kind of thing. Because if you maybe drop Nakamura and play Dalglish a bit further back and maybe go for a target man, maybe go for something like Sutton, your, your big pal Sutton, maybe. So I'm trying to think of another, another big centre forward in the last 60 years. Who's better than Sutton? I think they're struggling. Because traditionally, Celtic have tend to go for the kind of smaller McCluskey, McGarvey, Charlie Nick. Mm-hmm. Charlie Nick's first season, or the season Charlie scored the 50 goals, maybe he's a sub. I think, but uh, I'll go with that. I'm going to drop Naka, which is controversial, and I'll play, we'll play Sutton up front. And you're trying to think, could, could, could Jinky play in a 4 3 3? Does that work? I don't know. Is he more of a 4 4 2? He's not a wing back, so. So that's him knocked out of that position. So we'll go with that. Is that a team Foster, McGrain, Conley, Van Dyke, Gemo, McStay, Aitken with Dalglish playing in front of them, Johnson and Big Sutton and Larson. That'll do. That's a pretty good team, Jim. I mean, George Conley, I remember Hugh McDonald saying that in all the years, and he'd watched Celtic over six decades, mm-hmm. and Conley makes his greatest of love in yeah. well. He, he loved George Conley. Yeah, I thought he was going to be one of the greatest. He should have been. He should have been because he was he was an exceptional talent. He was a young guy as well. So it's not. I mean, a lot of these centre backs tend to mature. You know, tend to get better when they're like twenty six, twenty seven. He was only what twenty two, twenty three when he started playing there. If if not younger than that, what might have been? 
Another thing that uh, we often speak about is some players that you fancied would eventually wear the green and white hoops, but never did. And we've spoken to the likes of Tom Grant, who told us about you know Steve Bruce, Paul McGrath, these guys who might have played for Celtic, probably wanted to play for Celtic, and it never happened. And it's always the what if. Were there any players over the years, Jim, that you fancied for the hoops? I'll be a bit controversial here, because when you, you mentioned this earlier about somebody signing you wanted to sign, Morris Johnson <laughs> is the one, basically. Because I've got my, my kind of theory of the last 60 years of Scottish football is there's been four individuals that have had the most significant impact in, in, in Scottish football. And if those four guys didn't exist, or things happened differently, there'd have been huge effects on it. So I'll go. I'll go back the way at the start. Jockstein. Right. So so if, if Jockstein doesn't come to Celtic, the Celtic win nine in a row. No, they win the European Cup. No, they don't. Definitely don't. Go for another one. Jim Baxter. When Jockstein came, Rangers were the dominant team at the time. Baxter's their talisman. Baxter gets injured uh, in the European game, and within a few months of Jockstein taking over, Baxter gets sold. If Jim Baxter had stayed at Rangers. Would Celtic win nine in a row? Don't know. Will you pink up? Don't know. Discuss. Don't know. Fast forward, 80s, Sunis. If Sunis doesn't come to Rangers, do they win nine in a row? No, they don't. Which takes me to the question you asked me, Morris Johnson. Mm-hmm. If Morris Johnson had been tied up properly by the old board, would Rangers have won nine in a row? Personal opinion, I don't think they would have. Because the word on the street when Johnson had signed was Charlie Nick was coming at the same time. And if you Charlie Nick and, and Morris Johnson, and I always remember when he signed for Rangers, Ali McCoy saying that he thought Morris Johnson was in the top three strikers in Europe. He was phenomenal. Yeah. He's a 25, 30 goal a season player. If we'd have signed him and kept him, he'd have scored 25, 30 goals. And if they added Charlie Nick to the mix, they'd have won the league in the next one or two seasons easily. And that would have stopped the nine at the start. So in terms of, I know that's it's not really the question you asked, He's the guy that they should have tied down because he'd have made the big difference. And I had a lot of guys you think, well, they could have signed him, could have signed him. Would they have made a big difference? It'd be nice to have him or him or him, but in terms of significance, that's the one that got away. And that, that changed football forever, basically, because they go on and do the nine. And he scored a lot of vital goals, Johnson, including his first season when he scored the, the one in the last minute type of thing. So, so you take all that away and you stick him at, at Celtic Park. I think there'd be a different outcome to that. All conjecture. Obviously, it, it is, but it's an interesting angle. It really is, Jim, because I don't think there are many Celtic fans look at that and think, I wish we'd signed them because, you know, the disappointment in not getting them and then Aye. what he did afterwards kind of clouds that view. But you're talking about uh, an age that was covered in great detail in the Celtic fanzines. I yep. remember the, the Morris Johnson colour picture being on the back of Not the View mm-hmm. and he's running on to the field at Celtic Park wearing the Rangers tracky top. Mm. It didn't look right, you know. So talk to us about the fanzines, the emergence of the fanzines, how you became aware, and in many ways, Jim, how you actually utilised the fanzine scene yourself when you were involved in Save Ourselves. I think it was always taken for granted that the Celtic view was a bit of a kind of mouthpiece for the board, so I don't think many people bought it, and those who did buy it, I think it was a bit... Bit of a waste of time at the end of the day. And the fanzine came out and it was at the time, I mean, it was it was, it was well after punk. It was a good 10 years after punk. So it wasn't it was a, it was a punky thing, but, but a decade afterwards. And uh, and you started seeing these guys selling them at the grounds and wondering what these things were. So you buy these things and they're quite, they're quite funny, they're quite irreverent towards the boards and, and they become quite appealing very quickly. So all of a sudden you're a big Not The View fan and you, and you can't get your fix of Not The View. And most of the things they were saying, you were a hundred percent behind. And then once a Tim then springs up, and other things like Boys Road, etc., spring up from, from from that as well. And it coincided with Sunis coming to coming to Rangers, them spending the money, and it became really, really, really obvious that the Celtic board were out of their depth, basically. And the more you read and know what the view, the more you realised that they were they were so out of their depth. It wasn't just they were, they were maybe struggling a wee bit, and they could maybe just pay over the cracks. They were, they were miles out of their depth. And, and that was one of the things that, that made me and a few other guys thought, I wonder if we can actually do something here. And that's that's what that's we come out to save ourselves. And, and and we met with the fanzine guys uh, to try and do something together, to try and raise awareness of where we thought Celtic were going. Much easier back then, I think, in terms of, I don't think it would get off the ground with current social media, but it was quite easy to to get together and 
and and to send things to the board and for the board to get back to you and and give you a, a kind of almost relevance if that's the kind of right word it's almost like they're happy to talk to you although they might not agree with what you're saying they're happy to talk to you but I think the current board wouldn't be interested in you know, communicating with you at all I think you would divide the support as well because a lot of people would think they're doing a good job why not because I always remember what we did to test the water was uh, we made up about 5,000 leaflets and about 10 of us uh, handed out the leaflets really cold miserable winter's day it was either hearts or hibs at home and for every person who would say well done son good on you the uh, next person would say well, F off what are you doing you, you know so so then you realise that you know your view might not be the views of the majority of the supporters and until I got to the point you know 93, 94 when like the majority of people then realised what was happening that's when people stopped going to the games that's when the kind of boycott started and once once you threaten the money then things will change but when people were happy to come along and and pay at the gate and give them the money, then you know people are going to stop, uh, going to keep coming. And the thing that annoyed me was was, <laughs> was uh, I'd, I'd got a season ticket for the for the main stand for the first time in the in the eighty eight eighty nine season. It was after we'd, we'd we'd won the double, and it was chaos in the in the final game of the season or the game we clinched against Dundee, and we were in the stand, and the stand was like had like double the capacity that should have had that day. And we decided, let's just buy a season ticket. Now, back then, going to the games was, was dead easy. You could turn around at half two in the afternoon and say, I'll hey, just go to the game today because it wasn't all ticket. And getting a season ticket, there wasn't many season tickets about. So that was easy to do. So we get this brilliant season ticket. There's about 10 seats from the board. Great, great seat. But within two years, we're seeing things like, well, we're not advising you to boycott because that's that's entirely your decision. Who are we to tell you that? But we're going to boycott it. We're not reviewing our season tickets. So we gave it this brilliant, <laughs> brilliant seat. It's like, 10 seats for the board who could hear you when you shouted at them great great seat and never got it back basically because we eventually came back to Parkhead and you know it was in 95 94, 95 but we up in the North Stand we up in the Gods at the road and these seats are now like you know you can't even get near these these seats so so that was the sacrifice we made so so when they say what, what kind of sacrifice do you make we lost our dead good seats so yeah and the fans were a, were a big big help and uh, anything that we had to say with them can save ourselves they would put it in the, in the fanzines. I'm sitting here with a whole lot of fanzines in front of me and I'm sure there'll be a number of kind of Save Our Celts things in there. And then when Save Our Celts kind of petered out a wee bit, Matt McGlone and the Celts for Change guys came along and then they had the same support from the fanzines as well and eventually that kind of leads to Fergus and then Fergus saves the day. Mm-hmm. I mean, Fergus features heavily in the, the fanzines that we have in front of us, Jim. We've also got the entire Celtic view from season 1997-98, which is a pivotal season for the club, but also for yourself. We'll talk about that in a few moments. Fergus McCann phoned you one night out of the blue for a, for a chat. This was before he was the man everybody knew was was trying to set up a, a takeover bid. Well, Save Our Celts was kind of started off in 19, 1990 and uh, there were only five guys involved in the committee and, as I said, we leafleted Celtic Park and we set up a couple of public meetings that that a lot of the media came along to made the front pages, etc., etc. And I think through that, I was the kind of organizer behind that. Uh, the spokesperson was a guy called Willie Wilson, who was fantastic, uh, and I was the kind of kind of organizer sort of thing. And so, Fergus got my number through one of these kind of things, and I got a phone call one day at the blue. This guy phones, sounding like Groucho Marx on the end of the phone. Fergus McCann, who's Fergus McCann? Full of questions about who's Save Ourselves, what's all this about, type of thing. And then he actually. He so was on the phone for about an hour, just talking about what he'd done so far. He'd went to the board and the board knocked him back and he'd other plans and he's, he's in his 60,000 stadium and stuff like that. And, and, and back then, we're getting average crowds of about 20, 25,000 and he's talking about building a 60,000 stadium and people thought he was mad, but he was a genius. He was an absolute genius. So, uh, yeah, I'd, uh, I spoke to Fergus before he was Fergus, basically. Yeah, so... What we should actually do, Jim, is have a look at some of these fanzines and Celtic views because, you know, you forget really just how funny some of the, the fanzines were. I've picked one up here, not the view, number 42, and there's five guys on the front wearing gas masks. Mm-hmm. It, it's quite appropriate to where we are just now, Jim. I was just, I was maybe saying earlier, but when the, when the, when the fanzines first came out, they were basically bits of A4 paper, photocopied, stapled together. Very, very basic, and then as the years went by, they get a bit more sophisticated. Yes, yeah, as, as I said before, we were used to always getting not the view, be inspired by not the view. Felt as if you wanted to do something, uh, made you angrier. Actually, we didn't not the view in terms of all the stuff that was happening. Just wanted to do something about it. 
And have you managed to pick out any tidbits yourself that you want to cover, things that have caught your eye from these back issues? Again, looking at the early ones, well, it's, it's, it's kind of very, very basic stuff. It won't be my name, won't it? Number 40, actually the one with the gas mask on it that Paul alluded to. I think this is when the Save Your Silks campaign was kind of winding down. And, uh, and I've got a kind of two-page thing talking about, well, if you actually want to save Celtic, what are you doing about it? Basically, I think a lot of people are happy just to sit back and say, well, something will change. And I think there's something in here about uh, buying a stamp, where I say something like, well, we'd be willing to buy a stamp to try and save Celtic, because that's, that's all you're asking to do. Uh, because if you don't tell the board you're not happy, how will the board know you're not happy? If you keep coming and giving them money, what's their incentive for going? They don't have an incentive for going, just keep giving them the money. So the more people that maybe write to Celtic Park, write a letter, buy a stamp, help try and make some sort of change, tell them what you think. Oh, there we go. Buy a stamp to save Celtic. People are saying, nah, it's too much bother. No, it wasn't too much bother. Do it. And that's when you get the do it activists like Mark McGlone. And some of the stuff Mark McGlone done was incredible. Boycotting banks and... Standing outside the park and all this kind of stuff and back the team, sack the board, all this kind of stuff. You know, he took it to a whole whole new level and played a major part in changing what happened at Celtic Park. One of the things you mentioned there was about the, the humour in particular, not the view. I thought the humour was fantastic. And they ran a, a series called The Embarrass the Hoops, Jim. Aye. Which Joe Miller said they get a lot of stick for. The average Joe Miller said they got a lot of stick for that. I mean, which player do you reckon would uh, feature... And they embarrass the hoops. Well, I've got a, another wee theory about that as well. I, th- I think anyone who plays for any professional football team must be a ha- half decent player, in my view. And I think a lot of it comes down to luck. And we were chatting previously about some of the players that you've known that maybe could have made it but didn't make it through. It's a bad bit of luck. So, so I kind of struggled with that embarrass the hoops. And I can think of a number of players where you could, even quite recent players you could mention. And people might say, ah, they would be maybe going that embarrass the hoops. You think, well, did they get a chance? One, one that springs to mind was about, about five years ago, big lad, Amido Baldy, right, who gets slaughtered, absolutely slaughtered. But in most of the games, you get the last 10 minutes. And I think you'll find that in most people involved in football, you don't run a games to actually know if you're any good. And if you're getting 10 minutes, psychologically, what does that do to you? You get 10 minutes, you get two touches, he's rubbish. Get him off. And there was a pre-season tournament in Dublin where Liverpool beat them one, one, one nothing. Mm-hmm. And Amido Baldi scored the goal. It was a brilliant goal. It was a brilliant goal. And you thought, he's a player. There's a player in there. And then what's that down to? Is that down to coaching? Is that down to luck? Is that down to what? Is, that, is it about giving the guy a game? So I'm always loath to criticise anyone, no matter how bad they are. And you could go back to Raphael, second name, and he, and you say he was rubbish, but was he rubbish or was he just unlucky or was he and, and luck plays such a big part in anything but, but football especially you know you play the game you score a goal all of a sudden you're a superstar you play the game you don't have such a good game you're bombed and that's you finished so so I can understand people saying this guy was a bit of a dumpling and Wally Garner always seemed to kind of feature in there somewhere because he scored two and goals he didn't mean to score two and goals he played with Aberdeen he was a decent player maybe it just didn't work out for him there so, so I was always a bit kind of I don't think they went out intentionally to embarrass the hoops. They maybe just didn't have the luck at the right time, played the wrong game or whatever. So I was I was a bit sympathetic to, to people getting roasted in that. It's interesting you mentioned Willie because I eventually interviewed Willie Garner for his greatest ever 11 it was. I, I did that for more than 90 minutes and it's since been published on A Celtic State of Mind and Willie explained how he was a massive Celtic fan growing up. It was his mm-hmm. dream to play for Celtic. Halfy Danny were in the jungle that day when mm-hmm. he played, and as you said, it was a nightmare. See, I think, I think, like like any major sportsman, ninety percent of it's mental, it's psychological. Can you kind of deal with that? And uh, and unless you've played at that kind of level, you've got no idea. We've got no idea, and and, and we like to think we know what we're talking about, but we have no idea at all. I mean, I, I play, I play five sides once a week. I'm the oldest by by miles. And you know if you play your first couple of passes and they're bad passes, psychologically you're thinking, did I play this third pass? Or did I know did I play safe? And this is a bunch of old men and I wait Monday night. So if you're in front of 10,000 fans, 50,000 fans, you know, do you have the kind of mental strength to take a ball, do certain things, make a risky pass, take a player on type of thing? I think we've got no idea. We like to think we've got an idea, but we have no idea. And we love, you know, We'll go on social media and say, why is he playing him and why is he doing all this kind of stuff? We don't know. I mean, it's kind of, it's all kind of good fun to, to kind of think 
think we know. I think we know that Lenny should be doing this and Lenny should. Lenny sees these guys every day in training. He knows he's he's up for it. Or he's not up for it. And yeah. and if you take guys like Shved, well, why is Shved not? We've no idea why Shved isn't there. You know, there could be a number of reasons why we don't know. So, and getting back to the, maybe players aren't playing particularly well. Big lad Bio, I think there's a, 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 a player in there. But again, how much time is he getting? And that, that takes us back to, you know, football these days, it's about winning games. It's not about enjoyment. You know, Jimmy Johnson played at a time when I think it was more fun. I don't think the pressure was as much as it is now. And if you think of these two recent signings we've had, Soro and the Polish lad, we were near the first team. Mm-hmm. Now this was the sixties, and, and you spent decent money on players. They've been the next week, in the next week, but there's so much pressure to win games. And again, I don't know if it's kind of rose-coloured spectacles, it, but I think as you get older, maybe you don't enjoy the football as much, and maybe that's just a. That's interesting you said that because Andrew Ennis was up watching the game with us against Lazio, uh-huh. the primal screen guitar player. Right. Just name dropping Andrew Ennis there. You know people. He said the Good. exact same thing. But again, you, you, I, you could watch that game and enjoy it. I don't know if it's the kind of rose coloured spectacles thing. Uh, and I think what's been heightened is the whole nine in the row, ten in the row thing. Mm-hmm. That it's so historical and it's so close that unless a three goes up, if, if they go three goes up, it becomes enjoyable. That's your, that's your line. Above that, enjoyable. Below that, no enjoyable. Because two nothing's no good. Because they score, uh, what could happen next? And you've some, some games this season. Hamilton comes to mind. Hamilton game at home. Yeah. Horrible, cold night. Team not playing particularly well. Hamilton, 10 men behind the ball. one nothing, And you know they're going to score. And and that's not enjoyment. And then they score. And you think, this is... This, then Scott Brown pops up and it's great again. It's endurance. It's no enjoyable. And when you win the games, it's relief. And I think, however the 10 things works out, whether we get 10 or not, maybe after that, I think we can maybe start to enjoy the football a wee bit more. Because up to now, it's just, as I said, we can't play the new guys because you can't throw them into that kind of game. So you're playing the same guys week after because you can depend on these guys. Mm-hmm. And, and football costs a lot of money as well. So you pay a lot of money for something that maybe you're not being entertained. <laughs> you're just enduring it. And it's more important to, to get the points in the bag. And you feel happier about that than, than what you're watching in front of you. So, so I think that's a big difference between what football used to be like during Jinky's time and what it's like just now because I think back then it wasn't as tactical it was like goalkeeper would always punt the ball up the park maybe get the ball wide to a Jimmy Johnson or Wally Johnson whoever get the ball get high ball in the ball it's buying head goal now it's you know it's all tactic and it's all formations and it's all that kind of stuff and it's maybe maybe it's taking some of the fun out of the game or maybe that's just an old guy talking don't know the voice of experience Jim Oh, guy. You yeah. spoke about guys in Barrison the Hoops. One person who certainly didn't was Jackie McNamara. And I'm looking at a Celtic view here from the 97-98 season, which is pivotal in many ways. And, and one of them is that uh, you actually wrote a play on this particular season, which we'll talk about. There's Jackie looking like a schoolboy. He looks about 18 He's in about there. He's two, hi. He just had a kid called Erin. And the interesting thing is it was Erin who broke that news on Twitter about Jackie that, yeah. McNamara having that unfortunate incident with regards to a bleed on the brain it was, wasn't aye, it? Aye, that's, that's now, serious, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And he's on the road to recovery, but it's somebody that you met through your play. What's your, your kind of memories of getting Jackie involved? I found a play called Ben the Lake brought back and I've been fortunate enough to be on Celtic State of Mind a couple of times and, and a Celtic State of Mind has been pivotal in actually getting any success it has because it's kind of uh, exposed it to the wider world. So I'm very thankful for that. Ben like Brabant is about the season that we stopped it saying and uh, it's now played about 14, 15 times it went to the SEC we've got plans to put it on again hopefully later in the year depending on, on what happens with this uh, pandemic that we've got at the moment uh, but the first time we put it on uh, it was a theatre called Webster's in the west end of Glasgow and the big idea was to try and get one of the players that helped stop the 10 to come along and we were fortunate enough to get, to get Jackie who came along and took a bow at the end uh, and that was really good because that kind of joined up this this wee daft play into somebody who was actually there. And then after that, we managed to get a few other excels that came along. Murdo's taken about and people like John Fallon have came to see it and Joe Miller. Uh, and they've all said this is the this is the funniest ever Celtic play, the best ever Celtic play. So so it's been it's been, it's been good fun. It's been quite exciting meeting these ex Celtic players and uh, and for it to go, for it to have gone down as well as it's gone down. Because when I first I first wrote it two years ago, just over two years ago. 
and about two months before the 20th anniversary, it was to celebrate the 20th anniversary, sorry, of stopping the 10, and I wrote to the Celtic View, and I knew they'd be doing something for stopping the 10, and I said, I've written this play, and if you could mention it, that'd be brilliant. And then the 20th anniversary comes along, it turns out to be a Wednesday, exact, it's, it's the day the Celtic View comes out, and there's something like 50-odd pages in the Celtic View, and there's like 30-odd pages to, to uh, stopping the 10, and there's no mention in that at all. So, so I'm a bit disappointed, but understandable. So I'm thinking, well, you know, the trust that's such a tough play. So we fast forward about about eighteen months or so, and put on the SEC, which is like unbelievable stuff. And then the Celtic View ask us to come in and do an interview with them. So we've got this like two page spread in the in the Celtic View. So, so I went from like beat it, <laughs> it's a wee daft play to like tell us about it. This is good, and it's and it's worked out. It's worked out really well. We've got a fantastic cast who have been on a Celtic state of mind before. Laurie Ventry, James McInerney and Kira Lucchese. And uh, they're all phenomenal. And, 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 and Harold has helped in the background as well. Harold very kindly uh, posed with the poster and did a wee video for us as well, which is outstanding. So he's, he's a really good sport, Harold. So so it's, 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 uh, it's been good fun. It's been really good. We're talking about a, a season that... As you say, stopping the ten, or was it one in a row? It's a smell of the glove season, and we're looking through the Celtic views of, of that that time. One of the Celtic views that we're looking at here, Jim, is a response from Fergus McCann to being branded a dictator uh, with a picture of him alongside Saddam Hussein. Was that the Daily Record? Aye, I think the very unfortunate thing about about those times we we didn't have social media back then, so I think people were looking at the tabloids to get their football fix. And a lot of them were influenced by what was in the tabloids, whereas Fergus was doing a fantastic job in the background. Oh, for having a Fergus just now to sort out a lot of the stuff that's happening just now. He said what he would do, and then he went and did it, which was fantastic. He didn't suffer fools gladly, uh, and he kind of sorted stuff out. And the play's actually a bit of a homage to kind of Fergus, because it was, it was Fergus who put this in motion. If it wasn't for Fergus McCann, there wouldn't be a Celtic just now. And we've seen what's happened with, with other clubs. They didn't have a Fergus, so... Fergus is right up there with all the kind of uh, the kind of heroes of the past, your Willie Mayles and your Jock Steens and this kind of stuff. Because I think those fans who were anti-Fergus at the time, I think events over the past ten years or so have kind of seen that he was right. He was right. And what's interesting just now with the kind of pandemic that's happening, the fact that Peter Law has been criticised for stashing away money, who could have forecast what's going to happen just now? And the fact that it would seem to be okay money-wise, whereas one would imagine a lot of clubs are going to really struggle if not go bust over the next few months or so. So, so maybe a pat on the back to Peter Law for a change. He does a lot of things that maybe maybe I would disagree with, but uh, he's the one that's turned out Trump. So, but we didn't want to mention Trump. Now you, you've <laughs> been speaking about Fergus McCann there, and uh, legends, Celtic legends. One of the legends that probably because of the era in which he played, Jim, isn't mentioned as much on Celtic podcasts or Celtic uh, topical subjects as James McGrory. Now, James McGrory and Cathkin Park have a very special connection mm-hmm. in that James McGrory played his final game for St Rocks on Cathkin Park and he made his debut for Celtic at Cathkin Park, having signed for Willie Mealy at Cathkin Park. So there, there's a real connection between the, the, the mm-hmm. park that we've already spoken about and James McGrory. Yeah. You mentioned earlier on you play five or six asides every week. We're doing a James McGrory tournament at Cathkin Park once the pandemic clears up. Are you going to put a team in? And I'm going to ask you on, on this podcast so that if you see it, that's you, you're committed to it. I'm too old. Actually, uh, I play I play walking football, right? And, and I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of walking football. And before you all start laughing, about two years ago, somebody I used to play football with said, you Jim, you need to try walking football. And I had this vision of old men, zimmers and cotton his pads, pushing this ball across uh, a pitch. And I think there was an advert on about four or five years ago. It was one of the building societies or something like that. And it was all, that's what it was. It was all guys doing that. And you thought, no yet, no, no yet. And this guy said, no, it's brilliant. You should try it. So about about a year ago now, I was on internet. And up pops this video of Scott McDonald, ex-Celtic. And he says, I'm at the Tory Lane Centre. I've just had a session of walking football and I'm shattered. And you're thinking, hey, that can't be right. Can he be shattered because you're Scott McDonald and it's walking football? So I thought, well, if Scott McDonald's shattered, I should give it a go. So Glasgow Life, as it's called, to who run all the leisure centres are brilliant. I've got 20 sessions a week. So I go along to the first one, one night, and I've got no self-awareness. I'm thinking, who's all these old men? I'm thinking, hold on, I'm an old man as well. So I'm, I'm blending in here. 
and it was brilliant. And the reason it's brilliant is that there's two types of walking football. One's called low intensity and one's called high intensity. And it sounds a bit of a misnomer to talk about high intensity, but the low intensity stuff was that Bone Society advert. It's just, it's to encourage mainly men, I suppose, who are maybe are quite lonely, who have maybe had some health issues, to get you out into the fresh air, bit of walking about, kick a ball about, it's not that serious. But the high intensity stuff, it's war out there, basically. It's for guys like myself who, who've played a bit back in the day, who maybe haven't played organised football, I don't mean five a size, so it is war, basically. So it's, it's like three touches, so get it, control it, move it. Right? Head height, and you can't run. But when I say you can't run, it's like these power walkers in the Olympics, so you, you walk as fast as you can, and it's a fine line between this walking and running. So I goes along the first night, and at five aside, basically, I don't want to get hurt, because I'm old by at least ten years to the next guy. Stay at the back, play some passes, don't get hurt. Walking football, I'm messy. I'm, out, I'm scoring ten goals, and it's, it's brilliant. Because back to the next to my wife, this is brilliant, it's great, it's fast, because... I defy anyone to go outside and walk fast for an hour and not be tired. Because that's what it's like. Go the second week, 10 goals again, messy-like stuff. End of the night, coach comes across, I'm round the shoulder. Jim, I've got a trial in the morning for the Glasgow team. You're thinking, what? Aye, aye, over 50s. I'll be there. Yes, man, I'll be there. So I go along to this trial thinking that it'll be like, eh, not that good. The standard is really, really high. So cut a long story short, get in the team. There's a, there's a competition, there's a league uh, once a month up at Ravenscraig. Uh, teams down from Hearts, Air United, Stennis, Muir, Motherwell, Daddy, Daddy. Competitions all the time. There's now over 60s, over 65s. It'll be the next big thing. It will be the next big thing. Because you're talking about the, the generation, the baby boomer generation, who are coming, you know, late 50s, early 60s, retiring. And here's a chance to get back and play football, football. You know, no holes barred. Guys are getting sent off for fighting. The whole thing, it's it's and, and I uh, love it. So, so I'm doing that. I don't know how I get in that conversation, but, but walking football is the future. So, so you're going to put a team together for the gym. Oh, and that was that was the question. Like, if it's if, if, if it's walking football, I'm there. If it's running about football, then I'm not so sure about that. That sounds like kind of a uh, too hard sort of thing. Jim, uh, over the last five years I've been working on the Celtic Jersey book which is a, a historical document of every match worn Celtic Jersey uh, back to 1936 mm -hmm. I was unable to find any prior to that date so that it's a historical look back to the very founding of, of the club and all the jerseys that we've worn between 1888 and 1936 then all the match worn mm -hmm. ones afterwards and looking through some of these Celtic views it's interesting that the the Bumblebee jersey can be seen on Craig Burley on the front cover of one of the one of the Celtic views. Quite a popular jersey. What I'm always interested in, particularly now where we've just signed a new deal with Adidas, is what would be over the years your favourite home and away jersey. You mentioned the the Bumblebee one, and you know this better than me. For the play, I bought some jerseys for the play. I bought the Centenary top because that's what Tam wears. I bought what we'd call the George Cadetti top because that's what Keena wears. And then I bought a top from, from, from that season. But I was dead keen to buy the away top for that season, 1978. Mm. It's the Umbro Bumblebee. Couldn't get it for loving the money. So that one doesn't appear to be anywhere. There's a, there's a different Bumblebee one that came before that, the kind of Paolo De Canio one. Yeah. Could get that, but, but couldn't get near couldn't get near that one. The Bumblebee, there were three versions. Three right. Versions three there. Bumblebees. Three, three, <laughs> yes. Three different sponsors. Right. So you had the Umbro Umbro for ninety seven ninety eight. You had the previous the previous sponsor was C R Smith. It was Smith. a Bumblebee with C R Smith on it. Yeah. And there was an in between jersey which just had Celtic FC on it. Right. The question is were replicas actually sold of all three? I know that the Celtic FC one wasn't sold. Right. So that's maybe why you struggled to get it. I've got match one versions of them in the book. Right. But that's maybe why you, you struggled right. to, to that's get the thing it. about uh going back to the plays thing again that my my sister co-produced uh, the Celts in Seville with Celtic mm -hmm. and big James McInerney was in that as well. But because my sister knew nothing about football, she'd asked me then to go and source a lot of stuff. Right. And then I was trying to explain to her, you can't just buy Celtic jerseys, basically. It had to be 
of the Seville season it had to be the NTL years. And then when they go to Seville, you've got your Carling jerseys type thing. So, so one of the things you've got to get right for a play because people will pick you up straight away, particularly yep. you, would say that's not the right jersey. They didn't wear that, and all it might be is something really subtle, some small thing, but that's not the right jersey. You can't wear that. It's all about attention to detail, John. It's attention it? to detail, absolutely. So what are your favourites home and away over the years? You've given us your favourite players. What about the jerseys? I must admit, I'm, I'm not somebody who would, who would tend to buy a top. I think I'm from a generation where it's more of a younger thing now. I was fortunate enough to get a ticket for Seville, so I thought I need to buy that Carling one, is it one? That's the first time I'd ever, I'd ever wore Celtic strip. I'm not a big fan of wearing, wearing Celtic strips, or any, any strips at all, to be perfectly honest. But I like that George Cadetti one. Mm-hmm. I like when you see it up close and you see the kind of embroidery and all the kind of stuff that's on it with the kind of with the kind of logo and all that stuff. I think that's would be my favourite one. In terms of way tops, that one for that night seven eight season, the Bumble would be one. Or the kind of black and green one, the one that looks a bit of like an yeah. AC Milan into Milan type of one with a thinner stripe. Mm-hmm. I think that would sell well if they brought that one back out again. I've seen a few mock ups, Adidas style in the in the away one that you're talking about. That was a, Early 90s, wasn't it? The black and the green with the, the pinstripe down it. Aye, but I think there's another one that I, I, in my mind I see Gary Caldwell wearing one for some reason. All right, aye. So I'm so, thinking Nakamura. I'm thinking Nakamura. Aye, there was a Nakamura one and, and there's one with Paul McStay. Mm-hmm. They were kind of, kind of similar, I think. Yeah, from memory. Right. Absolutely. So that is the, the fashion part of the show. Cool. Finished now, Jim. You've mentioned a few things during the, the podcast about where we are just now with the pandemic. And it's important, obviously, for anyone listening in, because we're putting these podcasts out on a daily basis, yeah. uh, to obviously keep up to date, but uh, to try and remain and, and maintain a sense of calm within their own lives, despite all the worry and all the concern that this yeah. is bringing. How are you dealing with the current situation? Everything's cancelled. That's that's the thing. Uh, I, I, I try and play walking football three, four times a week. Cancelled. I'm mean, involved with football memories. I think you've come across it, and that's, that's a brilliant thing. Any of your listeners can go and go and volunteer for football memories. It's it's brilliant. I do a I do a, I do a care home once a week, and it's a mixed bag of people in the kitchen. That's been cancelled. And I think have you had the football barber one? Mar- There's a guy called the football seen, barber I've Martin. Seen Martin somebody, on which Twitter, I'm, yeah, yeah Martin. Because I did a they did a, they did a training course at Hamden uh, about about eight months ago. So when I went to that. And the guy sitting beside me has got a tracksuit on it says the football barber. So you're thinking, he must be worth talking to. So I end up, he then tells me his story. It's a fascinating story. It's the fact that he's worked in healthcare, mental healthcare, and uh, and discovered that within within care homes, there is no organised activity for men. And most of your care homes tend to be populated by women because women live longer. Type thing. And he took it upon himself to try and rectify that. And he's got a kind of pop-up barber shop. So he's into kind of care homes and he's got his match programmes and his rattle and all this kind of stuff. And, and some of the stories he tells are, are great. And in fact, it's one of these things that when you tend to volunteer for anything, as you know yourself, that you end up getting more out of it, mm-hmm. you know, and the stories you see and all that stuff. And I do, a, I'll, tell, I'll tell you a quick couple of stories, I think. So basically, you go to a care home and I had no idea what dementia meant. You know, you, you hear about it and I've never known anyone who's got dementia. And there's different levels of dementia and uh, so somebody just babbles on says nothing and some other people who you do something and they just spark something mm-hmm. and what they do with the football memories project is they issue cards so you've got all these cards and that's meant to you know spark some memories and the bit I didn't get was the fact that if I had to show you a picture of somebody just now and it was say a say a Hearts player from the 60s and you thought well that's you know, you try to think of his name and then some such Dave somebody and you see and that's it's Dave Mackay and you go, Why? Dave Mackay. So if I come back the next week and say, Who's that? And you'll see you showed me that last week, you're clear, that's Dave Mackay. But if you get dementia, you've forgotten what happened five minutes ago. Mm-hmm. And if you get some some of the some of the people who can remember stories, they'll start telling you the stories. Well Dave Mackay, I he played for hearts and I didn't like him because I thought blah 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 blah. So you get a kind of range of people that comes. And with a guy, Eddie, Eddie came in. So he's only been here two or three weeks or something and Eddie's in a wheelchair and he's really softly spoken and he's a Celtic fan. So you've got the cards out and you can see the cards and you're showing them Celtic ones and he's, he's, you know, he'll look at it and he's dead softly spoken and he'll say, it's Jimmy Johnson. That's right, Eddie, it's Jimmy Johnson. That's good. 
who's that? That's Big Billy, Big Billy, that's good, you know. So I showed him his picture, and he's thinking, who's that? So I think he's just, uh, is it Bobby Murdoch? And I said, no, dead close, it's another, it's, it's a Lisbon lion. He looks at me again and says, uh, is, it, is it John Hughes? And I says, aye, it's John Hughes. Do you remember John Hughes' nickname? So where do you think about it? And he says, is it Yogi? And I says, aye, it's Yogi. She says, remember the song? They sang about Yogi. So the care assistant's getting interested now. She gets, she gets the phone out. She's going to video ready now. Cause, and he, said, he says, aye, the song about Yogi. And he's thinking. And I said, it starts off, feed the bear. And there he goes, dead loud now. And he's getting videoed. Feed the bear. Feed the bear. He's here. He's there. He's every fucking way. I guess it's cut, cut, cut. I says, like, Eddie, can we do that again? Can we, can we cut the fucking bit out and can we put it in bloody? Aye, Jim, we can do that. Feed the bear, everybody. Brilliant. Brilliant. Superb. There was another wee guy that did, was a, this is a really, really sad one where a wee guy called Bill and he was party Thistle fan. And the first week we're there and you're, they're just trying to think of yourself, party Thistle players from the 50s or something like that and I'm struggling. And I'm thinking, oh, they've got the Jackie Husband stand, so he must have been a player. And I'm saying to Bill, do you remember Jackie Husband? Was he your favourite player? Husband? Ah, he's my favourite player. So every time you show my card or somebody, Billy McNeil, you say, is that husband? Oh, that's no husband. So you're desperate to have a husband card, but it didn't happen. So he was kind of slow the first week, and then the second week, he's a bit better. And he's, he's, he's a complete wind-up merchant then. He's picking the cards and showing other people. He's doing this kind of stuff. And then we get to one week, and he just starts singing. Just out of the blue, start singing. And it's some sort of, I'm assuming, sort of 1930s, 40s song. And it's a really poignant song about how he's lived a great life and doesn't regret a thing. And the other three or four guys start joining in. Right? So you're sitting there gobsmacked by this. And but one guy's no singing. Billy's no singing. So I'm saying, Billy, you know, join in. And he says, no, no, Jim, I only sing far away. As far away as fucking possible. <laughs> So, and then, guy, B. B. John comes up and he's got his scarf on every week. He sits with his Celtic scarf on. And, and you know, he doesn't recognise anyone. But when you see him, like, what about Jimmy Johnson? You see that a lot. Ah, we jinky, he was the best. He was the best. And you show him somebody else who's that. They don't know who it is. That's Bertie. Oh, aye, Bertie. Bertie was great. There's no more than that. So you've got a range of dementia. And there's a Georgia Rangers fan. And he's, he's brilliant. And you just show him anything and off he goes. And... Uh, if you back to the fifties, George Young, he was a big big one. A guy called Willie Woodburn, who got sin died after he got sent off three times. Those were the days, yeah. And George will say, "Well, oh, George Young, he was he was lucky because Woodburn got sin died, and then George Young was a right back, and then he his game sent, and he just he will just mm-hmm. rabbit away." And it's a brilliant thing. And if anyone's listening, go and volunteer to get involved in football memories. It's, it's, it's a brilliant thing to do. And like as I said earlier, a lot of the things you volunteer. You actually get more out of it mm-hmm. than they do, and it's not a lot of time. So, and it's something that's trying to push, basically. And certainly, these times where people are lonely, exactly, and what have you. So, yeah. anyway, that's that's, that's football memories. No, so, I'm glad so, you mentioned so, that. So, so, that's not on. Walking football's not on. Football's not on. So, so I'm just writing plays at the moment. That's what I'm doing. So, I finished the follow up to Bratback, which is Ben and Bertie, and we get back to '65 for that. And uh, Ben Bertie's a Bertie was a time traveller, as you do, type of thing. So, uh, I was chatting to Des McLean, you know, Des, Des would be a good guest for you. Des knows his Celtic stuff. Because yeah, uh, Des, Des came to see Brat back and loved it and spoke to him afterwards and he said, look, I'd love to do a Celtic play, so if you do another Celtic play, give me a shout. And I said, well, at that point, I said, I'm halfway through writing Bender like Bertie. And he just lapsed into this, like, five-minute impersonation of Bertie Old. You know, I can't do that, but it's like, I'll be Jinky with say, oh, my, film stars, film stars, all this kind of stuff, you know. And so I said, you're in, no are in. So, so Desmond, you know, we're in it. That's my kind of first person. So, so I finished that, and with all the stuff that's happening just now, we thought we'll leave that to maybe the start of next year when things start to calm down a wee bit. So so that's that's the next one. And because Bratbacks went so well, I have to make sure that it's of of a kind of similar standard to that yeah. otherwise it'll be saying well you know, it's not as good as that so that's been a bit of a challenge so so I need to change a few things because the way it sits just now it's kind of hard to stage that and I think that's something you learn we were chatting earlier but when you do something for the first time and you learn as you go yeah. that when I, when I first started writing plays it was like 
10 characters and 20 minor characters and 55 scenes. Well, how can you put that on a stage? You have to then narrow that down. So two characters, three characters, four characters, two or three settings sort of thing. So it has to be... So Bertie's time travelling, where's he time travelling to? And what is he going to do? And what games is he at? And, and that's been a learning curve as well because I know you've not seen Brat Back. It's uh, basically what I, what, what I was astonished by with the cast and Brat Back said that that the match scenes were actually the hardest to do. And I'm thinking they're the easiest to do. Mm-hmm. So because then brought back, there's something like six match scenes. So the scenes that are at the match type thing. And I'm thinking because I know no better, surely that's easy to do. Because if you're struggling, just shout, get your finger out your arse or something like that. You know, just dead. But they said, all the games can emerge into kind of one. And the games that are featured are the, are the four games against Rangers. So you've got the kind of last minute stubs equaliser, you've got Lambert and Burley and all that stuff. And the amount of times at rehearsals, they get the whole name mixed up. Yeah. And you're thinking, sure, they must know that. because, But from their point of view, they're trying to commentate on these games and act at the same time. And there's light shining on them. Type of thing. So, so lesson learned from that one. Because my big idea about Bertie was to have the whole thing on a supporters bus. Right. So it's after the game. So they're coming out after the game and they're talking about the game. And my other idea was to try and... It's going to be based in Mary Hill, for obvious reasons. And it was going to be somebody who had just moved to the high flats, which were just built at the time. And in terms of the research, I thought it'd be great to find somebody who went on a supporters bus from Mary Hill back in the 60s to make it as authentic as possible. And Declan McConville, obviously, is part of the Bertie Old CSC. So I contacted Declan and he says, I know the guy, very guy for you. And it's... Uh, Guy called Jim Divers. I don't know if you came across Jim. I've heard lovely guy, about Jim. absolutely yeah. lovely guy. And uh, he then came along, photocopied a whole lot of stuff, and he was actually the convener of the bus that ran from the Shakespeare pub. So straight away, the characters are convener. It's the Shakespeare. Oh, it's, you know, you're then tapping at him, and he'd, he was full of stories about what life was like back in mid sixties, mm-hmm. supporting Celtic, you know, on the bus talking about the fact that his mother made him up pieces and he would sell them on the bus, going to Aberdeen and places like this, you know, and they would go to the annual dance and at the time there was, there was, there was a handbook come out at the time, I know there's a handbook and there's a more more detailed handbook of a copy of that in there sort of thing. So so that was fascinating just in terms of how did people go to watch football, you know. And we talked earlier about trying to get the strips thing right to show you the kind of, the kind of detail you're trying to get into here. And maybe a, a kind of open question here is the fact that in 1965... Was Jimmy Johnson called Jinky? When did that Don't know. About? Or was John Hughes called Yogi? You know, so that kind of thing about, I mean, obviously, in the greater scheme of things, it doesn't really matter. But in terms of kind of getting it right, would you call them that? And it's also the fact, what I try to do within the plays, is try and make the plays as authentic as possible. Because my, I've, I've seen most of the football plays, I've been on BDB, the Celtic plays, are not. And it kind of feels like a kind of testimonial match when you're watching it. It's a bit kind of, you know, don't want to offend anyone and, and keep it kind of, for us, Brabant in particular, I mean, it, it kind of slaughters, you know, the team, as would the fans would do at the time. Yeah. And one of the, one of my funniest lines in the which actually wasn't a great, particularly funny line when I wrote it, but, but when Laurie says it, the whole place goes bonkers. And that's when uh, we're playing Dunfermline, and it's the second game of the season. We've just lost to Hibs. We're losing to Dunfermline. And Laurie's line is, whoa, hey, you, Jansen, fuck off and take that wee Fanny Larson with you. And the whole place just goes... Absolutely bonkers, right? Now, I've never seen a play <laughs> that we, we'd call that wee Fanny Larson, you know, and he's called that quite a lot, you know, the thing, because that's what fans are like, you know. And if you go back to the 60s, that's the other thing I was asking Jim as well, Jim Divers, you know, what were the fans' views of a Bobby Murdoch, say, because prior to Jock Steen, you know, a lot of the guys are underachievers, mm-hmm. you know, and if you, if you take that, that 65 cup run, Jockstein doesn't play Jimmy Johnson in the final. You know, so one would imagine a lot of people at Hamden are saying, is he playing that? No playing, you know, so, so he knows bugger all, Steen, you, you're going to get that. So, so so that's kind of in this one as well, whereby you've got somebody who thinks well, Jockstein doesn't know his ass for his elbow type of thing, you know, and there must have been, getting back to that rose-coloured spectacles thing, that, that the Lisbon Lions didn't play brilliant every single week. You know, they would be inconsistent, they'd be games, they wouldn't, and you're going to get the same kind of guys you've got just now. Yeah. Giving it pelters On all the, the time. Absolutely. And that's the kind of things, because you interviewed Laurie before, 
And that's another thing that I learned about comedy is about recognition. It's about people recognising, I. that's exactly what it's like. Mm-hmm. you know. And it's not all sweetness and light. Because I've seen, been a few Celtic plays where it's kind of, all you've got to do is say, oh, I love Jimmy Johnson. And people start clapping. This, I mentioned his name. I don't, I don't, Jimmy McGrory scores six goals and there's a round of applause. And you're thinking, that's that's a testimonial to me. That's So So hopefully this is similar to Bratback in terms of it's kind of, bit more realistic, a bit more authentic, and loads of swearies in it. So, mm-hmm. you know, so will you ever if you run Brat back again, will you ever change the title to that wee Fanny Larson? No, uh, there's a number of titles that we kind of thought. Another thing was, I wanted to avoid being triumphalist. I didn't want Cheerio ten in a row or mm-hmm. smell the glove or something to do sort of thing. And and Bender like Brat back is quite a quirky title because it's quite a quirky play type of thing. And then. And then we'll keep the bend that's going because that's that's kind of like a series. Then if you can do that, and but and they'll all follow. I, can, I mean, I've, I've kind of sent the script to a number of people. I've sent to Donald Heaven at the McConnell CSC because he he runs a he runs a bus as well. Sent to I sent to Jim Divers as well to say what do you think of this? And great, really funny, authentic, Daddy Dan, a few other people to make sure you know that you've actually hopefully get most of it right rather than just saying I'll stick this on and see what happens. So you've. So you've tested it with the guys that hopefully should know. So that's coming in maybe, maybe, maybe January. Ish. Maybe slightly delayed after everything that's happened. Aye, it might give aye. you more time to, to work on it, Jim. But aye. you mentioned the football memories. We've got Robert Harvey coming in tomorrow. So everybody can tune in and hear a wee bit more about Football Memories Good. Scotland tomorrow. Jim Ott, it's been an absolute pleasure once again. Hopefully we'll speak to you again Good before uh, the summer months are out. Okay, thanks Paul. Take Cheers. Take care, Jim. Bye for Thank now. You. Bye. 